today as we come to the table. If you put your mom and dad above me, if you put your children above me, if you put anyone above me, he says, you're not worthy of me. Wow, guys, that's heavy. I dare not change the words of the Lord. My job is simply to proclaim. But when I read this, I go, oh my goodness. I mean, this is a big deal. He's not saying we don't love them. As a matter of fact, you know, when you gave your life to the Lord, you love them more now than before that happened. What he's saying is when you bring in the sword, the word of God, it's going to cause division. Who are you going to choose? Are you going to choose mom and dad over me? Are you going to choose your kids over me? Whatever the case might be, saying, I have to be first. There can be no one that comes in between us. Everyone makes sacrifices in life. Some people give up tasty treats like ice cream and candy bars in order to keep a slim figure. Some people live without sleep because time is money. What sacrifices are you willing to make in order to follow Jesus? Pastor Mark teaches us in today's message that being a disciple of Jesus isn't easy. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Following Jesus is more than checking a box on social media. It's a life-altering decision that comes with a high price. It may be a job, a friendship, a relationship with a family member, or even your life. But the eternal reward is so much greater. Are you willing to trust Jesus no matter what the cost? Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, with today's edition of Come to the Table. Look at verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Now, guys, this is heavy. There's going to be a lot of heavy stuff from this point on that Jesus says. But what he's saying is, look, all they can do to you is temporary They can hurt your body, but I'll give you grace. God's going to give grace. I believe that. Again, testimonies throughout centuries prove that. If God ever calls us to suffer emotionally or physically, he will give us the grace to do it. He said, but that's the only suffering you're going to do for my namesake, which would be an honor. Although it doesn't sound fun, that would be an honor. That would be in the kingdom of heaven. That would be something you'll be glad that you were able to do. But the reality is, he says, that's only temporary. He said, don't fear them. That's all they can do to you. Here's who you fear. The one that controls your eternal destiny. He controls your body now, and he controls heaven and hell when it's done. It's interesting, the Lord mentioned hell here. Did you know that Jesus talked more about hell than anyone else in the Bible? More than anyone else. Why would he do that? Because he knows about it. The Bible says he created all things, and he created it. And he knows what it's like, and he doesn't want anyone to go there. And you say, well, then why in the world did he create it? Here's the good news. The Bible tells us that hell was not created for mankind. Did you know that? It says that hell specifically was created for the devil and his angels. That's why hell exists. When the Lord created hell, it wasn't for anybody in this room. It wasn't for any any of mankind throughout history. It was for the devil and his angels and the rebellion that they did against God in heaven because they saw God's glory, they still rebelled against it, and they were kicked out of heaven, and because of their accountability level, they'll now be separated forever in this eternal lake of fire. The Bible talks about hell. So then here's the problem. When mankind rejects Jesus Christ, his son, who was given so that no one would have to go there, here's the problem. It's not that God created hell for anybody in this room or around the planet, but you get lumped in with the devil and his angels. That was never God's intent. God said, I gave you my son. That's for them. I'm giving you the way out. Here it is. Grab on. Welcome to the kingdom. And if somebody says, I don't want your kingdom. Oh my goodness. Don't you understand? That's the future for those who don't want my kingdom. I love you. I died for you. Welcome into the kingdom. I don't want your kingdom. And he's going to continue to chase and chase and chase and call to and call to and beg. But there comes a point where our heart gets so hard or the time runs out on the earthly heart clock and it's too late. But it was never intended that way. He says, look, don't be afraid of man. 
Be afraid of the one that has that kind of power, the eternal power. He loves you. Here's the message he wants you to hear. Welcome into the kingdom. I've made a way for you through my sacrifice on the cross. All you have to do is believe and repent of your sin and follow me. It's not primarily that you'll go to heaven or hell. It's I love you, I want you with me, and you make the decision, and that determines the eternal destiny. He says, look, that's who you fear, the one that controls eternity. And now when he says all this, again, they're thinking, wow, okay, so if this is going to be happening, you don't want us to fear, and we know that we could be hurt by others. He now gives them comfort, saying, I need you to know how much I love you. I need you to know how much I care about you. And so watch what he does. Look at verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? That would be a couple of pennies in our money today. Now you think, why in the world would anybody buy a sparrow? They actually would eat sparrows back then. Uh, they'd buy them, and if they had them as a snack or whatever, different reasons for sparrows. I think, ooh, yuck. But either way, that's what they did. And so, again, he says, they're sold for a couple of pennies. And he says, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Guys, grasp this. He's not just speaking about sparrows. He's making a point. Every bird on the planet, every single animal on the planet, every sea creature. The point is this. There's not a single thing that dies on this planet that doesn't first have to get approved by God the Father. That's what it's saying. That's amazing. You think about it, if he cares if a sparrow dies, can this sparrow die? Today? Yes, let the sparrow die. Can this well die? Yes, let the well die. This elephant, whatever, this, you know, this dog, this cat, this whatever. Because again, we're in a fallen world and that's one of the results. Death entered the world. But God still controls that so much that he says, there will not be a single death of the animal kingdom that I don't control. And his point is, if I care that much about the animal kingdom, how much do you think I care about you? I mean, think about the, the difference here of the two. He says, not one of them falls to the ground. He makes the point, he drives it home. He says, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. You're of much more value than any animal on the planet, than any bird, than any animal, anything of the planet. You're much more of value. And notice this, this is amazing. Again, grasp this, your very hairs are numbered. He doesn't say they're counted. Scientists can count hairs. As a matter of fact, we now know that the average person has about 140,000 hairs on their head. Now, some less, you know, I realize that. And the older we get, some getting even less. So a scientist can do that. Someone who calculates mathematics can do that. No, notice what he said. The very hairs on your head are what? Numbered. Oh, my goodness. Who does that? Only someone that's madly in love and intimately involved in your every minute detail of your life. You know, hair falls out, right? And we see it on the floor. We sweep it up and put it in the trash, and so we should. God goes, there's 70,222. And sweep another, there's 83,560. What? Yeah. I'm so involved and intimate in your life, I numbered your very hairs. And when they fall out, I recalculate. Because this is amazing. Why would he be so intimate to show them such detail of his care and love for each of us? He's making the point. Yes, you may suffer for me, but you need to know how much I love you as you're making this choice. If you're going to sacrifice for me and choose to suffer for me, you need to know that it's for a purpose, that it's for a reason. And it's for somebody that is not just asking you to do it. I am so in love with you. I'm so intimately involved with you. I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you before time began. Before he said, let there be light, he knew your name. This is not just a nice cliche. The Bible says that's a fact. Before even the earth was formed, he could have named you. He could have said where you'd work, who you'd be married to, when hair number 20,836 was going to fall out. And he needed to let them know that level of detail because if they're going to suffer for him, they needed to know they were greatly loved and there was a great purpose for it. Verse 31, do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. In other words, I love the environment, I love animals, I love creatures, but you are way more important. You are way more valuable. I didn't make the earth and the animals in my image, but I made you in my image. And you are way more value than any of that. Therefore, verse 32, look at that. Whoever confesses me before men, he's been telling them they need to go out, they need to confess, they need to be bold. He says, all right, if you do that, now knowing how loved you are, therefore whoever confesses men before me, him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. Picture this for a moment. What's this going to be like? 
I don't know. I know this. When somebody gets saved, all the angels roar and they just celebrate in heaven. And we know there are myriads and myriads of angels and how loud these guys must be in the glory of heaven and all that's going on. He says this, if you will be bold and be vocal, like I've asked you to be, but people will be me. I know, but you know that I love you. And I've shown you how much. If you'll be vocal, here's what I'm going to do. When we get into heaven, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce someone to you. And I want to tell you the stand they made for me. And I want to tell you that they did this even though their family separated when they did it. I want to tell you they did this even though the entire office turned on them and called them a hater and a bigot. I want to tell you they did this even when society said that they were a problem and they needed to be removed. Let's all give them. And who knows? I don't know what's going to happen. But can you imagine standing there, Lord, and the roar of the angels? He said, I'm going to declare you because you declared me. Isn't that great? But from this point on, he begins to speak some very sobering words. And notice what he says. But whoever denies me before men, him also I will deny before my Father in heaven. You see, as wonderful as this confession will be for those who were vocal for Jesus Christ on this earth, it'll be just as bad for those who weren't. Now, let me encourage you in something. We've all denied the Lord. I haven't. Yeah, you have. Let me tell you how. Maybe you haven't. But probably all of us have. Have you ever missed an opportunity that you knew you should share and you didn't? Or maybe you're supposed to share with a family member, but you just didn't want the consequences. Or share with a friend, you didn't want the consequences. Or maybe you were going to share something and someone that was very important in your eyes was there and you didn't say anything. He's not talking about that. He's not saying a temporary failure of boldness. He's not saying if you do that, I'm going to deny you in heaven. No, he's talking about a lifestyle. He's saying if you choose as a lifestyle to deny me, Nope, I'm not going to follow Jesus. I'm not going to proclaim him. Nobody's going to know about it. I don't want to be a part of this. He says, if you do that, I'll deny you in heaven. But as a lifestyle, if you honor him with some occasional stumbles, maybe not being as bold always as you should have been, he recognizes our frame. He knows we're made of dust. He says, I'll proclaim you in heaven. So it's a lifestyle thing, not a moment by moment. Don't beat yourself up on that. But we do need to say, God, give us boldness that as a lifestyle, we begin to be vocal and to be a witness for you. And then he goes straight from there into this. Do not think. Now, again, look at this. This is heavy. Again, from this point on, there's going to be a lot of heavy statements here in the next few verses. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. How about that on this year's Christmas card? (laughs) I don't suggest that. What does he mean? What about where the angel said, I bring glad tidings and and peace to men on earth? He did, but here's what that says literally in the language when the angel came. You know, the Christmas card doesn't give you the full picture. What he literally said is, peace on earth toward men who love me and who do my will. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't love everyone. He loves everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's not about God lacking love. What he's saying is, I realize that by coming into the earth, I'm going to separate families because some are going to choose me and some are not. I realize I'm going to separate office spaces. I realize I'm going to separate, you know, people just in regular conversation and whatever the case might be. He said, because of the very fact that it's going to be a sword that separates, he said, you either get in through me or you don't get in at all. There's going to be a division here. And so, again, you have to remember, it's almost like, uh, notice he says, for I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. What he's saying is even your own family may reject you, but I want you to be bold, not rude, not mean, not arrogant, not judgmental. You know, I'm going to have, you're going to hell. Not that stuff, being gentle, but truth. The only way to the Father It's through Jesus Christ, and it's going to cause division is what he's saying. There's no other way around it. Now, it's interesting here. When you read this in the language, I get this whole picture in my mind. I want to share Mark's world with you. Literally what this means is when you do this, a sword will be thrust between you. The language says a sword will be thrust. Imagine you're standing there talking to your family. You're talking to friends, and and you say, and they're going, yeah, you know, I believe you can get there anyway. Buddha, Muhammad, Islam, all these ways, all roads lead to God. And you guys, you don't need to be so narrow. I'm glad it worked for you. And we all kind of believe the same thing anyway. We'll all find our way there. And you say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Bible says there's no other way to the Father but through Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4, 12. Jesus said in John chapter 6, no one goes to the Father except by me. And the moment you say that, well, I don't believe that. That's ridiculous. I can't believe that. Boom. It slams right into the floor, this invisible sword from heaven. It's a sword thrust right between you and them that goes, this is the line. 
Don't back down. Don't be rude. Don't be obnoxious. Be loving. Be gentle. But say, you know what? Listen, I'm sorry. This is what Jesus said, and there's no other way you can enter the kingdom if you don't come this way. And it depends on which side of the sword we stand on. It's going to depend on where we are for the rest of eternity. And hopefully they'll come to the side of, you know, of the Lord, and if they don't, there'll be separation. You have to understand that. If God had just come down to the earth and said, everybody just get along, let's all be one, let's all just be friendly, let's all sing together, and let this, don't everybody relax, how many people would be eternally condemned because they don't realize we're fallen and we have to be restored to God? We're a fallen creation. We're all separated from God at birth. And the only way to be reconnected to God is through Jesus Christ. He is the only way to get there. It is a sword that divides. And the more people turn away from God, the more divisive the sword is. And the more firm it gets and the more people turn away. He says, even your own family is going to do it. Listen to what he says. Again, this continues to get even more intense. He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's coming right into the middle of our family life and challenging us. He's saying, if you put your mom and dad above me, if you put your children above me, if you put anyone above me, he says, you're not worthy of me. Wow, guys, that's heavy. I dare not change the words of the Lord. My job is simply to proclaim but when I read this, I go, oh, my goodness. I mean, this is a big deal. He's not saying we don't love them. As a matter of fact, you know, when you gave your life to the Lord, you love them more now than before that happened. What he's saying is when you bring in the sword, the word of God, it's going to cause division. Who are you going to choose? Are you going to choose mom and dad over me? Are you going to choose your kids over me? Whatever the case might be, saying, I have to be first. There can be no one that comes in between us. And then he says this, and this is where we talked about death earlier. Once we die to ourselves, it sets us free. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Here's the third division. If we won't take up the cross. Now, we read that today, and we all know what it means. Take up the cross. We get a picture of Jesus carrying it, and we all know as Christians. But at the same time, the cross is something wonderful to us today. We lose the meaning in some degree because we come to the cross. We want to run to the cross. We want his forgiveness. People wear crosses for necklaces today. You have to understand, this was a form of execution. This meant death. How do we rephrase this? It would be this. He said, he who is not willing to die and follow me is not worthy of me. Are you willing to die? So what are you telling us? You mean physically? Look, I'm saying to die to who we are, to ourself for Christ. It probably will never be physically other than we would just die naturally. But it might be. You may be on the mission field and have to die. I heard a story about a guy that uh, when, was with another pastor. He was a Calvary Chapel guy with another pastor on the mission field. And something happened where they both thought they were going to die. They didn't die. They lived. But they said, we're about to die. And the guy that was there said I, he was very afraid. He was scared he was going to die. And he was with a pastor. And the pastor turned to him and said, what a great day to die. <laughs> and although it was kind of like, oh, my goodness, he said it was almost like a jolt of reality. It's like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to die at some point. How much better than to die for the name of Jesus? I mean, look, we can go to heaven and say, yeah, we, what did you, how did you get here? Well, yeah, I lived my life. I grew up in a Christian life. It was in, the, in America. It was a Christian country. It was in the South. I was really even friendly to Christians. And, and there were times people got mad at me and said, don't tell me that Jesus stuff. It was kind of rough. How did you get here? Well, they, they cut my friend's head off, crucified my other friend, and they decided to slowly torture me to death because we wouldn't renounce Jesus. Oh, oh, okay. Well, um, welcome. <laughs> I'm not belittling the life that we have. I'm saying, listen, guys, we've had it pretty easy. And the bottom line is, if we can lose the fear of death, no one can stop us. If you don't fear man, what are they going to do? Look at Paul. Why was Paul so successful in spreading the gospel? He said, I don't care to die. I'm ready to die. And he said, you know what? To die is gain. He wasn't trying to die. He knew that was in God's hands because not a sparrow falls to the ground without God's permission. He knows the hairs are numbered, which God's not going to let anything happen until it's time. But the reality is, I'm going to do this for the Lord. You're not going to be afraid of man. You're not going to be afraid of a virus. You're not going to be afraid of anything. Now, we may die in those fashions. We may die of a virus. We may die of mankind, at man's hand. But we don't die afraid by the power of God. We do what God has called us to do. And so, are you willing to die, he says to them. You've got to be. You're not worthy of me if you're not. This is heavy. This is contemplative stuff. This is challenging stuff, but I love it. Because it separates. It decides on which side of the sword we're going to stand. Boom, the sword has hit the ground. Where are you going to stand? Where are you going to stand? And I believe it's going to get more and more intense as the days go closer to the return of Christ. We better make up our mind now. 
Make it up now so that when the time comes, there's not an opportunity to run. Your mind is made up now. Do it now. Notice what it says. He finishes this whole thing in this segment. He says, he who finds his life will lose it. He's going to make his point. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That is, if you're living for yourself and just pursuing what you want, you'll never be satisfied. It's not going to fulfill. Only I can fulfill. Only my spirit can fulfill. But if you lose your life and say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you, then you'll find life. I can tell you guys, when I left my life behind, when you left your life behind, you know the testimony. That's when the joy came. That's when the fulfillment came. That's when the purpose and life came. It's in Jesus. That's where it's found. And now he goes to talk about our reward. If you do this, there's going to be great reward for everyone in this room. You know, we worry about the dollar falling and the economy and whatever. Listen, we may lose everything down here, but everything you've sent on ahead is going to be there forever. And how do you send it on ahead? By serving the Lord now. And he now he encourages them by this reward, should you suffer for me, and you will in some form and fashion. He says, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. That if they receive you, they're receiving Jesus. If they receive Jesus, they're receiving the Father. If they don't receive you, they're rejecting Jesus, and they're rejecting the Father. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. He who gives one of these little ones, that is a believer, only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall no means lose, by no means lose his reward. If you serve the Lord, you're storing up in heaven and you will one day be paid. And our Father pays better than any earthly boss. And your returns are going to be way better than anything the stock market or anybody else could ever do down here. It is forever. No one can touch it. And you enjoy it forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We have such a great future ahead of us, don't we? How exciting it is to know the Lord and be a part of his kingdom. Listen, precious brothers and sisters, we're family. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I don't stand up here as Mr. Bold. Don't play that game. I have the same fears you do. My heart beats just as fast. But here's what I've seen. Here's what I know God will do for all of us. If we say, God, I need you right now. You've got to give me boldness. I don't want to back away. I don't want to shout. I want to do it in love. I want to do it in grace. I want to do it in mercy. And I want them to see your goodness. But Lord, I can't shy away. Give me boldness. The sword has slammed in the floor. And there has to be a decision on which side we're going to stand. We have chosen to stand with Christ. Now let's pray for the boldness to do that and to invite others in the kingdom as well. Let's pray. Father, how exciting it is to know you, how exciting it is to serve you. Lord, you've told us that there's going to be a divisive sword, your word. The fact that you're the only way to the Father. There is no other negotiation. There's, that's it. And only those who accept that will enter into the kingdom of God. And Father, I pray you would give us boldness to declare that. Help us to be loving. Help us to be gracious. Help us, Lord, to use your words and your demeanor and your character in doing so, but not to shy away from the truth and to be vocal. Lord, to shout it from the rooftops as you've commanded us to do. Well, our time at the table of God's word has come to a close for today, but seize this moment to draw closer to Jesus right now. Will you come and sit at the teacher's feet with us? You know, Matthew was close to Jesus. He actually walked with him, talked with him, ate with him, and traveled with him. And in this verse-by-verse -verse series through the Gospel of Matthew, Pastor Mark is taking us up close and personal with Jesus and the disciples who followed him. And together, we'll see Jesus tell stories, perform miracles, astound the people, and frustrate the religious leaders. We'll witness Jesus dying on the cross, experience the despair and fear the disciples felt that day too. And then we'll see him rise triumphantly from the grave. To listen again or share with a friend today's message, along with many others, can be found at thewaymedia.net. Once again, that's thewaymedia.net. Once you're there, you simply need to click on the Come to the Table tab. Listen, we'd love to pray for you or answer any questions you may have. So reach out to us through the questions and comments link or call us at 865-609-1385. That's 865-609-1385. Please don't hesitate to reach out and make sure you're staying grounded in God's word by reading the Bible every day. Allow Jesus to grow you as you draw close to him daily and be willing to go where he's guiding you 
Pastor Mark has prepared our next verse-by-verse review of the book of Matthew. So put your bookmark there and make sure to join us here the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.